mechanics, thermal physics, electricity and magnetism, waves and optics, and atomic physics. Those are the five topics in CSEC physics. Mechanics is about the biggest one, one of the biggest. Electricity and magne- magnetism may take the cake, but these two are by far, hey, these two are by far the biggest. They like cover over 50% of the syllabus. And we'll be looking at those. Uh, We'll be looking at mechanics in the next upcoming videos. Mechanics, unboxing mechanics. When you unbox mechanics, you're going to get measurement, graphs, units, statics, pressure, turning forces, Hooke's law, Newton laws, motion laws, energy, a whole set of theory on energy and energy conversion and how energy is used in the Caribbean. La, 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 la. But today we are going to do the pendulum lab. Useful for private students who are doing paper three as well. Um, and useful for the CSEC student all around. So let's go. Simply because asking questions is the best way to study continually testing yourself. I will start this video with a series of questions, eight questions in all. We will seek to answer these eight questions in this video. What is a pendulum? What is oscillatory motion? Oscillatory. Oscillatory. What is a period? What is a period in terms of a pendulum? What is meant by a period in a pendulum? What factors affect this period uh, in a simple pendulum? We'll be looking at graphs, the T versus L. By the way, T is for period. Uh, T squared versus L. There's a key difference between these two graphs. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this line of best fit and finding the gradient oh that should be a question finding the gradient and using the gradient to find g can you use the gradient in these graphs to find g if you know the answer to these eight questions already well this video will just be revision for you if you don't let's dive in so a simple definition for a pendulum will be a weight suspended from a pivot so that it can swing freely any weight suspended from a pivot so that it can swing freely and it moves to and fro about a point wash wash about a central point um and that's oscillatory motion it's oscillating about a point right and any oscillation we can develop the term period and it's actually the time taken for one complete oscillation so let's see how we'll find this t this one complete oscillation an oscillation is the movement from where you started, you go up there and you come back, boom, that's one oscillation. So you need to go and come back to your spot. You can also take oscillations from different spots, but it'll be kind of ridiculous. Go pass it and then come back. That'll be one complete oscillation there as well. And if you come with your stop clock and you try to measure one oscillation, because of the limitations of reflexes, um, uh, just humans, you wouldn't get a nice answer. But we have a trick for that in physics. Do you know how we find T in physics? Yes, repetition. Repetition is the key. Hey, come back to that. So what we'll do is we displace the pendulum, let it swing, and when it reach up here, we start the clock one two three four five six yo i'm doing the wrong thing i should be counting like this one two you understand three four my pendulum not supposed to get longer but i just wanted to show you what happened in there and you count that swinging pendulum up till let's say 20 and if after 20 oscillations you decide to stop bam you stop your clock and your clock reads something like i don't know maybe 10 10 seconds that sounds like a little bit it take 10 seconds to make 20 oscillations what does that tell you it means if it's taking 10 seconds to make 20 oscillations you have a pretty accurate understanding that it's taking approximately 0 0.5 seconds to make one oscillation so that's how we measure oscillations in this pendulum lab so you need to be very aware of that don't go and try to measure one actual oscillation in itself you want to use that little repetition technique they will be looking out for that what are the factors that affect 
T. The factors that affect T. And coincidentally, what does not affect T? T here, remember that T is the period. Factors that affect T. There's only one real factor that affects T in terms of your lab. And that's... Do you know what it is? That's the length of the pendulum. The shorter the pendulum, something is going to happen. The longer the pendulum, something is going to happen. So the length... And there's another factor, but it doesn't really come into play unless you are an interplanetary traveler. Gravity, right? Strength. Um, gravitational field strength. Acceleration due to gravity. If you manage to change that, you can change the time period. So it's worth noting. It's worth noting that mass does not affect T. You can make the bob heavy, you can make bob small, bob light, bob big, it's not going to affect it. Wind and thing could affect it, but we're assuming no um, air resistance and them kind of thing. You know, we always assume in them thing in physics. So there's a relationship between period, and you see the L there, and you see the G. This is the formula. There's a way to prove this, but I'm just giving you this CXC level. I'm just giving you this. T is equal to 2 pi. 2 pi, 2 pi shows up a lot in these kind of oscillations thing. 2 pi, the root of LG. Echo! Yeah, that kind of echo from that root. 2 pi, the root of LG. Nice. We can keep that for the future. Graphs. You should know this graph, T versus L and T squared versus L. So this is what a graph of T versus L will look. Um, at the time, you can just bring that up on the screen there. Notice the graph of T versus L forms a curve, but the graph of T squared versus L, T squared, let's go to this graph now, editor, um, director, T squared versus L actually is a linear graph. It forms a line. And keep in mind, we are man always manipulating L. We are always changing. So in the lab, you will start off the pendulum at a certain length, and what will you do? You'll cut the thread or maybe wrap it up higher so that the pendulum gets shorter you have a different l you get your um responding variable you get your t again with this new length then you shorten it new length get a different t shorten it shorten it and we notice that if we have this graph we get a curve if we plot this graph if we plot the t squared values versus l we actually get a straight line interesting stuff now why is this um, let's see if we can get some insight into this. This is the equation relating T, the period, to LG, right? So um, length is LG is gravity, acce acceleration due to gravity. So 2 pi, in this situation, we want to get rid of the square root sign. That's what we normally do in math. So well, to get rid of the square root, we square both sides, and we'll end up with this. This will square to 4. This will square to pi squared. This will get T squared. And we get rid of the square root sign. And what do we want to make the subject of the formula in this case? We want to make the gradient, an idea of the gradient, the subject of the formula. Now, we had t squared against L. So the gradient is really the t squared values, the change in t squared values with respect to the L. So it's really um, something like this. Does this ring a bell to you all? Del T squared um, over L, del, delta L. So this just means change. Or in other words, y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. So that's your gradient there. Um, so if I make that the subject of the formula, to make that, I'll just take this L and send him down there. This 4 pi will, squared will stay there. The G will remain here. So we end up with T squared over L is equal to 4 pi squared G. So, in other words, what is this telling me? Remember, this is a gradient. In other words, this is telling me we can now use the gradient of the graph to discover gravity. <laughs> to discover the value. Hopefully, hopefully, when you do this, you get a nice 9.8 looking figure, right? Um, so, your gradient of your graph is supposed to be equal to 4 pi squared divided by 9.8. When you do this lab, if you don't get G to be, if you get G to be 9,000 or some kind of thing, you immediately know you're, you're going wrong. 9.8 meters per second. Um, 
squared. Now a couple of you may be confused, so let me just say um, this m is y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. That's how we find the gradient, where we just take in two points on the graph. This is just a random graph sketch idea. You don't want to take two points that are really close to each other. You always want to take points that are at least 50% of the graph. That's actually the rule in your syllabus. Shh, top secret. Don't, if you take two points like this, you will actually, yeah, yeah, you can actually lose marks for the exam. So take two points that are near to, um, sorry, far from each other, over 50% of the graph. They want the triangle to look like, you know, more than 50%. And when you find your gradient, things nice. So use points that are easy to spot the X and the Y coordinate, but more importantly, use points that have a kind of 50% distance. This red up. So just to recap, now you know what is a pendulum, weight suspended, free to swing, oscillatory motion, moving about a point to and fro, backward and forward, left to right. What is a period? You know that a period is the time taken for one complete oscillation. What factors affect the period? You know that only length and gravity can affect the period. You know how this graph looks. You know how to get this graph. You know how this graph looks. You know how to get that graph. You know how to plot your... We didn't talk about the line of best fit. Hmm... Let's talk about that just now. You know how to find the gradient. You know how to use the gradient to find G. Wait, wait, wait. Before we go, let's talk about the line of best fit. Um, so with the line of best fit, it can be tricky sometimes. What you're trying to do is get a line that, you know, I have, a, I have something here for drawing lines just now. Eh? About that going through as many points as possible and the same number above. A same number below but that could sometimes tie up because what you're really looking for is that the same sum of all the distances above must be the let me show you this example so like if i have points like this my line of best fit might actually be uh this this may be a better line of best fit than trying to get the same number of points above uh, as below let me just ratch that point let me see that point was about there so this looks like a better line of best fit because this distance is equal to this distance plus this distance and we gain a nice two points to cut through the line as well so there, those are some kind of things you want to keep in mind and some of the mistakes that i see students do do when it comes to the line of best fit thinking that there must always be the same number above as below or always try and get as many points to cut through the line as possible effectively you're trying to balance the line so that it gives the best um estimation for all the readings a line of it is entirely possible for a line of best fit to not touch most of the points it's, a, it's possible enough talk about that enough for this video you all press like on the video if you all want more physics videos like this you're going to get more anyhow whether you want it or not <laughs> you're going to get more anyhow so um no need to make this unnecessarily long but uh, i think i see everything press like subscribe